So I've got a, a book that just came out recently uh, giving my view about objective chance. Uh, it's called Chance in the World. And um, I promote a, a Humean story about objective chance, which is in the tradition of David Lewis, uh, vaguely, although there's a, a, a lot of differences. And, and uh, so it shares some things with, uh, with Barry's approach. Um, but it's kind of unique. And what I'm going to do today is try to sketch um, uh, how my approach differs from some others that, that try to account for chances in statistical mechanics and uh, why I think that uh, my view is the Goldilocks view that uh, gets the, just the right amount of, uh, of everything, but in particular of a priori uh, versus uh, input from the world into the question of uh, how we understand the chances in statistical mechanics. So that's kind of the outline of what I want to do. Um, so classical statistical mechanics seeks to derive, uh, one of the things it seeks to do is derive the thermodynamic-like behavior of macroscopic systems that, that is so important to us, starting from classical Newtonian mechanics. And the core idea is that this behavior is not guaranteed ever. Um, instead, what we're going to try to do is show that um, it is how systems will behave with very high probability. But given the underlying deterministic mechanics, what can probability mean here? So Wayne already talked us through that, that issue very nicely. Um, there are some desiderata for handling uh, this question. The statistical mechanical probabilities should be uh, well-defined. They should be able to underwrite, uh, in at least a weak sense, the real uses of statistical mechanics that, that we make in predicting how systems behave um, and the frequencies that, that uh, we see of things happening. And, and the big one, which fe features uh, largely in a lot of discussions, we'd like um, the statistical mechanical probabilities to not make disastrous retrodic retrodictions. And they shouldn't tell us um, that if we have uh, a cup of water with, with a, um, an ice cube in it, um, then 10 minutes ago it was, it was most likely at equilibrium and the, the ice cube formed in a spontaneous fluxion away from that. But there's the danger with certain recipes for handling things with the time symmetry that that disastrous retrodiction uh, could, could result. So we try to avoid that. Um, all right, so I said I'm going to try to go light on this, so I'm going to kind of uh, uh, skip this. But the, the point is in statistical mechanics, um, at some point, one way of thinking about what you do is introduce Boltzmann's law, which is um, uh, sort of what we're trying to derive. The idea is that at, if at time t0 the Boltzmann entropy of an isolated system is low, uh, then it's highly probable at any time after that that we have uh, Boltzmann probability at t1 greater than we had at t0. And uh, the challenge then is to elucidate what we mean by highly probable and find a way of arguing that Boltzmann's law is true. Um, so, uh, right, I've said that. Um, so three ideas that I want to look at. Um, first, that Humean, uh, sorry, that uh, statistical mechanical probabilities can be understood as Humean uh, style objective chances, which I've um, defended in some work co-authored with Roman Frigg, and Barry has defended in work co-authored with David Albert, uh, and on his own too. Um, second, uh, statistical mechanical probabilities are determined by actual frequencies of macro, macro state transitions in the world. Um, my friends from Israel, Mayor Hemo and Orly Schenker, published a book several years ago. And this is the view that they take about the, the probabilities that we introduce for, for statistical mechanics. And the third is uh, what Wayne just told us about, although he didn't go into the statistical mechanics so much. He gave us the, the core of the idea using um, that interesting dynamical system of the parabola, uh, the parabola gadget. But Wayne's idea is that statistical mechanical probabilities can be seen as epistemic chances. OK, so um, well, I don't think we're going to need to do much with uh, phase space and with blobs evolving. Um, but the basic idea is what, what we saw with, with Wayne's. I mean, if you have a dynamical system and you have some sort of probability distribution over the possible set of initial states, then you can evolve that distribution function forward using the dynamics, and then you get a probability distribution for things at a later time. Um, and so the idea with, uh, of course, in 
statistical mechanics, we typically want to, to, to understand why things start far from equilibrium and they always kind of wind up there. Um, well, right, these, these details I don't think I need to talk about. Um, a macro state, um, something that we can actually observe a system to be, be in, the coarse-grained properties of a system, um, is the kind of thing that um, evolves under the dynamics and it spreads itself out in the, the available uh, space space of, of states. And so if you put a, any kind of probability distribution, think of it as a credence or just some function over an initial macro state and then evolve that forward, you'll get uh, a new distribution over the blob that results from the evolution over time. So here's uh, a fundamental postulate that can be put forward to introduce probabilities um, in statistical mechanics. It's a static probability rule. So let's suppose that a system is in a macro state M sub i, and A is a measurable subset of M sub i. So there's a macro state, and then there's some subset within that. Um, and suppose that A is a measurable subset. Then the probability that the system's actual state its actual microstate, microstate is in A, is the measure of A as a proportion of the measure of, the, of that macrostate. And this is the, the Lebesgue or uniform uh, measure assumed on, on that macrostate. OK, so that's, that's just something you could say. Uh, I'm not saying what, where can you just pull that out of air and say, here's, here's a postulate that I'm going to put forward. Uh, no matter what the measurable set is within that micro, that macro state, uh, m sub i, uh, I'm going to assume that um, this probability uh, fact holds. But I haven't even told you what that means yet. I just used the word probability. So we'll see how that works. Um, now, these are static uh, probabilities. Um, you could just take these to be literally correct as descriptions of systems out there in the world. Um, but that's not testable. You can't just sort of peek under the hood, uh, look at the actual microstate, and, and find that. But the alternative thing that's more interesting is to use these static probabilities to define um, macrostate transition probabilities, which gets you something that you can actually observe. So talk, look at m sub t plus. That's a subset of all the points in a macrostate m sub t. And it's the subset of points that will evolve under the dynamics to a macrostate of higher entropy after some time, delta t. Let's just grant that that's a well-defined uh, subpart of the macrostate. Um, then the probability that the system evolves to a state of higher entropy after time, delta t, is given by, by that static probability rule as this. And so one goal of statistical mechanics is to show for macrostates uh, that are not equilibrium states that this probability is extremely high. Um, and now we're looking at probabilities that are about measurable state transitions, observable events. And then the second note, although I won't really say anything about this, is here is where in standard discussions things start going wrong because we bring in the time symmetry of the dynamics. But I won't really touch that today. But um, we do want to say, uh, I will mention the past hypothesis um, um, as something that just about everybody who, who uh, takes this sort of approach at one point or other has to, to postulate. We want to be able to say that increase in entropy towards the future is highly probable, um, but not commit ourselves to entropy in the past towards the past uh, being highly probable. You just make a stipulation postulate that the system that you're interested in came into being in a state of very low entropy. In essence, you say, don't, don't worry about retrodiction. The system that you care about when it started was in low entropy. Okay. Now, the system of interest to you might be the whole universe. And that's the way that Barry and David go. Or it might be a branch system. Just, you know, you might be making this postulate again and again and again whenever you encounter an isolated box uh, of gas or, or a cup of water with an ice cube in it or something like that. Um, other philosophers tend to, to go that way, and I, and I would count myself with them. Um, 
but the, the hypothesis is basically the same. And uh, so then what you say is that for all t times t greater than t0, the probability at those later times that the system's microstate lies in some region A is basically the measure of the intersection of A with the, um, well, RT, I forget what RT is, but the, the R, oh yeah, here it is. RT is the intersection of the macrostate with things that could have come from the initial low entropy past state. So you basically just condition on the fact that the past history is known, it started out in lower, low entropy and got here, and now we're going to just work things forward. That's the prescription. The probability of being in the subset A is the proportion of the current macrostate that overlaps both A and the forward evolved blob of the past state. Okay, so, right. All of this prescription um, is sort of nice technically and, and can be used to at least make an argument that uh, what we want, which is the high probability of evolution towards equilibrium uh, without a bad retrodiction uh, back to equilibrium in the past, um, works out. But none of that tells us what do we mean when we talk about probability. I just, again, I said the word. Here's the, the make a postulate that the probability is such and such, but I didn't tell you what that means. So how, how should we interpret uh, the probabilities? Actually, we'll look at these four, but I'm going to go very, very quickly um, over, uh, sorry, there's a, should be a carriage return here. Um, we'll look at the way I do it with, uh, in my work with Roman Frigg, given my uh, understanding of Humean chance. Um, Barry and David's uh, somewhat different understanding of, uh, of Humean chance. Um, Hemo and Schenker's uh, frequentism approach, and then Wayne's epistemic chance. All right, so let's go. Now, Humean chance in general, and, and I, I learned it uh, at the breast of David Lewis, so to speak, um, starts from these two basic, uh, basic ideas. The principal principle tells us most of what we know about objective chance, most of what uh, we need to preserve in the whole concept of objective chance because the principal principle captures why it's useful to have this concept in the first place and how we actually use it. So when Wayne told you how we um, apply uh, the principal principle every time that we do statistical testing to try to find out about the bias of some system or something like that, he's exactly right. That's uh, application of the principal principle even though you can read a dozen statistics textbooks and they'll never tell you that. Um, second, objective chances uh, for humans are not primitive modal facts or powers or propensities or, or anything like that, but rather facts entailed by the patterns in the events and processes in the actual world. Um, the actual world's events often being called the human mosaic, everything that happens. Um, and I'm not going to go into any detail about that. Um, further, generality about human approach to chance is that the objective chances are the chance rules or, or laws, if you want to take that path, that are to be found in a best system, a best systematization of all these facts in the mosaic. Um, so the best system is extracted from the entire history of actual events in the actual mosaic, and it has the, the best sort of combination you can find of three virtues, simplicity, strength, and fit, which means basically um, seeing the actual frequencies the way you'd expect given the chances. And the Humean insists um, there's nothing go uh, funny going on. There's no forcing and there's no pushing or, 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 or quasi-causation or probabilistic causation or anything like that. There's just patterns that we extract uh, from the mosaic. And now the way I developed this with, uh, uh, in my book is in the same tradition as I've just described, but I only offer you a best system account of chances because I'm not a Humean about laws of nature that are non-chancy, um, and I won't go into why. Um, the more significant uh, feature of the way I approach objective chance is that it should be very, very pragmatic, um, user-friendly, 
the goal is not to, to try to argue that the best system of chances for our world has one axiom that I can write down on the board for you. I'm content if there's a big telephone book sized set of, of chance rules that are all sort of equally useful. Um, and, and maybe talking, some, some of them actually do talk about people's names in telephone books and, and others talk about um, boxes of gas and others talk about, who knows, quantum, uh, quantum state transitions. I don't know, but the, there could be all sorts of different rules written out down at very different sorts of ontological levels in the way I developed this idea. So that's quite different from the way that Barry does it, and David Lewis did it, and maybe anybody else, although no, Craig Callender has a similar idea too. Okay, so, um, right. Basically, the chances, what are they? They are just the patterns in the mosaic of our world which are such as to make the adoption of credences equal to the best systematization rational if you can get that information and have no better information. So that's the way I think about them. Another part of my story is um, sort of prefigures or um, just gestures in the direction of what Wayne was telling us about without actually developing in too much detail. But I, I do say at one point that, um, look, it's, it just seems to be a fact about our world that whenever you look at, at how things are at the microscopic scale, they seem to be distributed randomly. And I call that the stochasticity postulate, or if you want, apparent fact about our world. Um, we just see nice stochastic look, looking distributions of stuff all over the place. And once you've got that, then when you plug that into a sort of a, a causal apparatus or a dynamical system or something like that, you get a, a stochastic nomological machine which generates a very reliable regularity. And Wayne was telling us about a, a subclass of these kind of machines, ones that take almost any sort of distribution of initial conditions and output, what, what did you call it, a, a, a tractor, a stable attractor distribution. Okay. And so there's a slide, number 24, that sums up the whole view, but I won't try to, to read that. Let's, let's take it ahead. Now, coming to stat statistical mechanics, um, one way that the, my kind of Humean best system might, take, uh, involve, might give us the chances in statistical mechanics is just by directly containing prescriptions for macrostate transitions that are simply based on the patterns that exist out there of the way actual gases behave in actual boxes. But um, the best system prescription has this idea, well, look for simplicity too, and look for strength covering a lot of systems with one simple rule if you can. So a candidate best system might also contain something like um, those static probability rules that I uh, mentioned before, and also a past hypothesis type rule, allowing us to sort of have a dynamics that, that uh, micro derives macrostate transitions um, without having to postulate them sort of uh, directly at the superficial level. Or it might contain both. The best system might actually give you both, and if it contains both, then they should simply be consistent enough to not uh, clash too often. That's all I require. Um, so a question for, for my approach is, could a good candidate best system for our world contain a micro-level based chance rule like the, the Boltzmannian statistical mechanical rule that I talked about earlier, even if our world isn't a Boltzmannian classical mechanical world? Maybe it's a quantum mechanical world of some sort, maybe not Bohmian. And I think I can argue that yes, um, the micro level, see, this is a, an extremely pragmatic viewpoint. One of the best ways to systematize and give you interesting, important rules for understanding how gases behave might start by telling you, look, a gas is actually a bunch of quantum particles, but forget about that. Pretend it's a bunch of, uh, bol uh, of little billiard balls in a box and apply a, this prescription. The simplicity and fit of that addition to the system may, may mandate it's being included there, even though the, mos the actual mo mosaic doesn't have those things in it. So that's an interesting uh, 
what I take as an advantage of, of the pragmatic approach. Now, does a best system for our world actually contain these type of chances? Um, I want to say arguably yes. Um, who knows? I'm not a I'm not an Laplacian demon, so I can't look at the whole mosaic and, and start looking at all the possible systems out there. We I'm like limited like all human scientists are, but it's very possible to argue that what a scientist is doing is essentially trying, on the basis of very limited evidence, to make guesses about what that Laplacian super scientist would tell us if they existed and could talk to us. So I, I would say um, whatever empirical evidence that we have that in, in the ordinary sense supports Boltzmannian statistical mechanics and its applicability to certain kinds of systems equally supports the existence of those chances in the best system. That's uh, the way I plug my system. Now, Barry and David's approach to statistical mechanics uh, is, is quite different because it really starts by taking, I think, the, the ontology more seriously. Suppose or pretend that the world is fundamentally governed by deterministic laws such as those of classical mechanics. And suppose further that it's true that a, that a very early state of the world existed um, that can be said to have been a very low entropy macro state. Then what they do is say that a Lewisian type best system of laws plus chances together um, could be much stronger than a Lewisian system without anything that mentions chance by simply adding the past hypothesis statistical postulate as an axiom laid down for at, at, at the beginning of time. You put a certain uh, uniform measure over the low entropy state and, and introduce that static probability rule and get all the, the macro state transitions that you want after that. Um, and from, they get a whole lot more uh, if they're right because they make this uh, claim that, uh, that Barry calls the mentaculus, um, which is not just that you can get all the Boltzmannian um, statistical mechanical probabilities you want, but you can get the laws of the special sciences like economics and psychology and things like that, all flowing out of this one uh, simple posit over the initial conditions of the world. So it, it's, uh, it's bold. And uh, I have concerns like, like many people do about, about the starting points and, and some of the features of Albert and Lohr's approach. So looking at the first um, point about how they start. Well, unless Bohmian mechanics is somehow true, we know that this is not a world of, of, determ of particles moving under deterministic laws. That seems, well, we don't know it. It looks pretty, pretty unlikely. Um, but Lewisian laws, if you stay inside the Lewisian tradition and you're offering a Humean account for this world with its actual mosaic and you want it to be giving you the fundamental laws, you're really kind of stuck with the ontology that the world gives you, or you should be. So Lewisian laws are, are, are not amenable to the kind of the hand-wavy pragmatic idealization move that I was telling you about a few minutes ago. If the world is actually um, the way that some non-Bohmian version of quantum mechanics says, then all this mentaculous story just is set aside. And, and probably Barry says, fair enough. But, uh, no, or Barry says no. Well, we'll hear, we'll hear about that then. OK. The second thing, the, the past uh, hypothesis on, uh, about the initial state of the, the world. Um, well, even in classical mechanical worlds, uh, if they have gravity and they're infinite, I think there may be technical problems uh, that prevent one from applying this, this framework in a con coherent and consistent way uh, there. A Lewisian system could be much stronger, yes. Um, and I, this is part of the story that I didn't tell you before, but um, the way I think of simplicity when I talk about simplicity and strength and their, virtue, their virtues that we want in a human best system, part of simplicity is simplicity for users. In other words, you want axioms that real people can use to then 
calculate the chances for real events happening. And um, so calculational simplicity counts for something, but nobody can, can really literally calculate anything starting from the past state on the universe. Um, and and I, I worry that it, it's also true that nothing can be proven mathematically um, that we can count on local systems, say, around here on Earth, behaving as if a local past state could be posited. Um, so, so I worry about this technical aspect. Um, both I worry about technical aspects, and I also worry about the fact that it's not a calculation that we'll ever be able to do. So it's it's um, it's it sort of stays in the realm of in the head of the Laplacian demon. Okay. Um, so those are the concerns I have about uh, Barry and David's way of understanding the chances in Boltzmannian statistical mechanics. Um, I'll go through this quickly because I'm not going to uh, go deeply into what they say. Uh, Wayne said that there's two things that can be definitely ruled out when you want to understand chance. Uh, and one was frequentism. So these guys are, are in your ruled out camp. I, I do fear that you think I'm ruled out too. I think that, uh, but you can tell us later. Um, because Humean objective chance, the way I plotted it, is like frequentism with, with elegant corrections if you want to think of it that way. Um, so what they do is they, they don't take the, the route of, of taking any a priori measure, Lebesgue or, or any other kind of thing, sort of pulling it out of thin air and imposing it on, on, uh, on available parts of state space. Instead, um, what they do is look at macro state transitions that happen in the world as they're um, the primary input data uh, to give them the right probability distribution or the right measure to put over uh, parts of phase space for a given system is to be found by looking at the, the transition frequencies in the actual world, doing the frequency calculation and figuring out what the, the right measure should be. By the way, that's also something that can't be done, uh, but anyway. So they say, when a measure is chosen in order to calculate the transition probability from an initial macrostate to a given macrostate after a time interval t, according to our probability rule, the measure is chosen on the empirical basis of observed transition probabilities. Now, that can't literally be a, a statement of, of fact, because nobody's ever done this. Um, so I think that what they mean is that um, observable frequencies of stuff that actually happens in the world, past frequencies not necessarily observed by us, are the underlying basis. They would need to develop a mathematical technique, uh, and they don't really give us much hint about, uh, about what that ma mathematical technique is from going from macrostate transitions back to a mu. So um, all right. There are concerns that I have about the whole idea of frequentism that the way they, the way they develop it. Um, you're going to need a lot of identical copies of systems with 10 to the 23rd particles in order to get the frequencies that can actually determine a distribution for you. And notice that the phase space for um, 10 to the 23 molecules with a certain energy uh, is, is not the same as the phase space for 10 to the 23 plus 11. It's just a very different phase space. Um, and then a box of a different size with the same energy um, plus a little bit more energy and 36 molecules less, completely different, and so forth. So the world is unlikely to oblige with enough copies to even get frequencies going, I think, uh, for their approach. Um, so there's a possible t response. You could say, well, look, I, yeah, I know that there's not enough copies of every particular kind of phase space that we need, but we'll think just about extending the measure from a, you might have a certain kind of phase space that has plenty of copies, and we can, we can do things with that. And then we'll extend the measure to other phase spaces. But how do you, how do you extend a measure from one phase space, phase space to another? I can think of 
very, various ways that might be done, and they might conflict. So there's technical difficulties galore that, that face this approach, I'm afraid. What all of these technical difficulties are going to do, um, and charity of interpretation would, would oblige us to say is, well, no, look, we need to go a bit pragmatic, pragmatic here. Look at the, the transition frequencies and look at what happens when we have plenty of copies of the same kind of system, and then just sort of generalize in a natural way, right? Um, but if you go pragmatic and generalize like that, what are you doing? You're offering an elegant systematization of the facts as they are out there, which is basically moving three quarters of the way to the story about chance that I was telling. Um, further concerns. This is not too interesting because I think that probably most of us agree that frequentism has multiple problems. But if you've got too many copies, that is to say infinite numbers of copies of, the, of, of uh, things in the same exact uh, state space, then your frequencies become undefined <laughs> and, uh, and you're in trouble again. Um, because they base their, their probabilities on past frequencies, uh, that implies that there were no probabilities in the early days of the universe. Um, you could resolve that by not just looking at past frequencies, but frequencies over all time, the way the usual Humean recipe goes. But again, then you're just moving closer to being a Humean about chance. All right. Um, let's finally get to uh, Wayne. And um, he didn't really talk about how his view applies to um, statistical mechanics in detail. And I don't know the details much, but I read a paper that he wrote seven years ago. And so these comments are kind of based on that paper, which I assume has, it's largely survived intact into the book. Is that mostly? Um, so remember that his approach to epistemic chance starts with a class C of reasonable subjective initial credence functions. Not too spiky, not crazy, uh, but other than that, fairly arbitrary. Um, and these are all credence functions over, say, the initial state M0. Now, you, you notice how there's shading. It's lighter here and darker there. That's meant to illustrate that it's not just a uniform measure, but a measure that is varied over the, over the region of that space. So I should be pointing here, of course. Um, and then you evolve it over time, and uh, you get something that's evolved. Um, the claim is probably more than a hope. It's uh, extremely likely. Uh, because of the nature of the dynamics, after evolving forward, all the members of C, long enough, they all make essentially the same predictions regarding measurable properties of systems. OK, um, but of course, crucially, C can't contain arbitrary um, distributions, or, or that simply is, doesn't turn out to be the fact. When you know the dynamics, you can sort of reverse engineer a perverse initial credence function that stays perverse or makes the wrong predictions for as long as you like. But it's going to be very weird looking, very spiky. And as Wayne uh, said, not at all uh, robust under perturbation. So you start with one of these initial credence functions that's very strange, and just give it a slight nudge into a slightly different, and, and suddenly you get back to being in the realm where it evolves to uh, the nice attractor distribution. Is that right, Wayne? Um, so just about any old distribution at the initial uh, type M0, once you get to talking about equilibrium, um, becomes so, well, things become so densely filibrated, um, the, the, the area should stay the same, but it's uh, sort of an, an extremely fibrous, filibrated thing spread over the equilibrium uh, state that it's effectively uniform measure. So um, Wayne starts with these ingredients. These, this class C of credence functions uh, about states of affairs at time t0 that a reasonable agent could have in light of information that, that is accessible to the agent. The dynamical map, the dynamics, uh, 
that maps you to from states at t0 to states at t1. And that will induce a mapping of any probability distribution to a new probability distribution. Um, he didn't talk about much about this. A set A of propositions about states of affairs, uh, other stuff, or just other propositions. And a tolerance threshold for differences in probability below which we regard two probability distributions as essentially the same. So those are the ingredients. And then the proposal is roughly this. If there's a proposition S about future events, such that the time evolute of any of the distributions given in C assigns essentially the same probability to S, then S has an epistemic chance equal to that probability. There's no claim that all agents should have the same credences over regions of phase space ever. Um, the objectivity, insofar as this proposal gives us objective probabilities, comes exclusively or mostly from the dynamics. Um, if we specify C carefully, we can also avoid disastrous retrodictions, but uh, I'm not sure exactly how Wayne wants to make that work. He didn't talk about that, so we, we won't talk about that. Um, and I th this is a virtue, a real virtue of this approach. The epistemic element that you find in this is, uh, uh, makes it nicely mesh with the partly epistemic nature of thermodynamics itself. Um, so my concerns that I want to raise, and hopefully we can discuss this, and if I, uh, yeah, I think I'm doing okay on time. Um, I'll try to finish soon, and then maybe Wayne will have a few words to, to answer the questions I raised before we open it up. So the first, I mean, what should count as a reasonable initial credence distribution? Um, I think there may be a tension in the fact that C has to exclude a lot of possible distributions, um, but it has to do so without the criterion of exclusion turning into something that looks like this, uh, anything that would spoil the convergence of all the, the, the functions onto e, uh, the same probability for S, and also without narrowing down C to very, very few members. Um, so I don't know if um, it's super easy to achieve this or, or, or not. But here's things I think you can't do when you're making up the list of excluded credence functions from his good set C. You can't say, uh, we'll exclude distributions that assign high density to microregions of phase space that evolve anti-entropically for a significant uh, time periods. First, because that looks like cheating, the building in what you want. But a second problem is that it could leave in ultra thermodynamic, heavily spiked, um, weird initial credence functions that get you to equilibrium almost instantaneously, and thereby disagree with what the majority say um, over intermediate time periods. Um, you also can't say, we'll exclude arbitrarily odd-shaped distributions, say sinusoidal in even number dimensions, or Mickey face-shaped. Um, and you also can't say, we're just going to exclude all strongly spiked uh, around small regions, I think if you're going to solve the problem of disastrous retrodictions, I think you're going to need to have some very spiky uh, in credence functions in there because that's what uh, will get you the right retrodiction. So I'm not sure how, how, how all of this works. Um, what I'm a little more concerned about um, is what do we say about a possible world that's possible according to classical statistical mechanics um, in which anti-thermodynamic behavior happens sort of all over the place and reliably. Now, it, it doesn't have to be a world that's so anti-thermodynamic that human beings can't live in it, but maybe uh, that strange things happen. Like the gas doesn't all, just suddenly all accumulate in the corner, but sort of regularly we get waves of high pressure in this part of the room and low pressure in that alternating. and. Whoosh, whoosh, something like that. Um, what then happens uh, um, in, in that kind of world? Because the concern is basically that um, two elements determine what the epistemic chances are for Wayne. One is that set C of allowed credence functions, and the other is the dynamics. 
And that's all, as it were, a priori. And so the world, the facts about what's happening in the world, don't get a window in to, to have any say about what the objective chances are, which is entirely opposite of Humeans. So I'm concerned about that. Um, here's something that Wayne said in the old paper. Um, our judgments about what sorts of processes occur in nature and our judgments about what sorts of credences are reasonable for well-informed agents are closely linked. If there were processes that could reliably prepare systems in states that lead to anti-thermodynamic behavior, then it would not be unreasonable for an agent to attach non-negligible credence to sy the system having been prepared in such a state. And we would adjust our judgments about what are and are not reasonable credences accordingly. That seems all right to me. Um, if the scenario is you're in one of these anti-thermodynamic worlds, um, but you don't know what the dynamics is, you're going to uh, look at how things are behaving and use the prescription uh, with the principal principle to update your credences about what are the epistemic chances. And you'll come to the wrong conclusions. Rel you'll come very quickly to the wrong conclusion. Why? Because in the world I stipulated, the epistemic chances are the same as in this world. Because they're only determined by two things, the a priori elements, the, the good set C of initial credence functions and the dynamics, and that's the same in that world. So if we look at, here's Wayne's principal principle for epistemic chances. Credence in proposition E, given that the epistemic chance of E is X and A is X. Um, now you're in a, I, I'm just not sure that I'm understanding right how to, how to apply this, how to read this. But so you're in one of these anti-thermodynamic worlds. Um, the epistemic chance is still the same as it is in the real world. But you've had all these observations of weird behavior of the gas in, in the room. But this principle says your credence should be x, it seems, if I'm reading this right. Now, that relies on saying that this evidence A is admissible. Same th word that you, Lewis uh, and, and I use. Um, so um, I'm going to skip that. The concern I have is um, what I just laid out. This principle seems to be insensitive to the actual facts of what happens in the world, which your observations of which may be plugged into A. Um, and thereby to give horrible advice about what your credence should be in that world, unless we say that all this evidence of anti-thermodynamic anti behavior should be taken to be inadmissible evidence. But notice that it's just ordinary observation of things happening in the world, which according to Lewis and most people's application of the principal principle, it has to be admissible evidence. So that's the first thing. But if you do insist that it's inadmissible, then you're basically saying, well, Epistemic chances are prescriptive, except if you're in a world where they don't give you the right predictions, in which case something else should be prescriptive. But that's moving a little bit in the direction of what I say. Because what I say is, let the actual facts about what happens and the frequencies and the patterns of events have a, some say in determining what you take to be the, the objective chances. So, um, so I think that. Um, that's why I say that uh, my approach to human chance uh, uh, gives you kind of a Goldilocks uh, view. I hope that Wayne will, will refute this soon, but I, I am worried that Wayne's epistemic chances are hostage to the world's initial conditions being where they are not. Either the, his principal principle becomes a, sort of a bad principle because it's not a compelling constraint on rationality, or we save the day by using the inhibitability clause but to take the latter course is to move in the direction of Humean chance. And it's also hostage to getting the class of reasonable credence function specified in a plausible, non-ad hoc manner, but maybe that's possible to, to do. But if you're a Humean, like Barry or me, you don't have to worry because we don't start with anything about uh, credence functions. So we don't have to find a way to restrict their class or wash them out or anything like that. So I, I claim that 
Humean chance gets you all the epistemicity you need uh, via the PP. And now in the interest of longer discussion, I, I'm not going to, so that's why I think I'm, my view is more of a Goldilocks view compared to Wayne's. And I would say other things against, uh, in comparison with Hemo and Schenker or David and Barry, but you, you get the idea. So let's stop here. <laughs>